Hey folks, we're in the shop at Banks Power. I want to find out, are diff covers really worth what you pay for them? Or are they just bling? So this is part two. We started this a few weeks ago. We had no idea what it would turn into, but we wanted to do it scientifically. We wanted to do it the same way every time. So we had to come up with the, what the test consisted of. So this is part two. I have this curiosity about everything is mechanical, but as an engine guy, I'm making horsepower up in the nose of the vehicle and the drivetrain is taking it away, all the way to the tires. And even the tires take some of it away. So, how much? What's going on? The guys are all running aftermarket diff covers around here on their trucks. And I'm kind of going, what's that all about? Started looking at the, at the ring and pinion, at the differential itself. What's going on in there? Because... It, it looks like these guys are adding differential capacity, in other words, the amount of lube you can put in them. It looks like these guys that make the aftermarket covers are raising the liquid level at fill. And I was curious, well, where the hell's the liquid level when you're running? So we kind of conjured up a, a way of seeing where that is. And I'll show you that little bit of in instrumentation. And we... Uh, look at the active level inside under the cover on all the uh, covers we're testing, this is quite accurate. Uh, we can also watch the fluid dynamics. Sometimes you get a little bit of bounce in the tubes. It depends on how much work is happening inside this thing. If you look at a stock diff cover, the inside has a radius to it similar to the radius of the ring gear. So it becomes apparent that the guys that designed this had this shape in mind. They didn't make it a different shape for a variety of reasons. Temperature, parasitic loss, life expectancy, fuel economy. There's a whole bunch of reasons this thing is shaped the way it's shaped. I bet a lot of you are wondering What's underneath the diff cover? What's going on in here? Uh, so this is the ring gear. This little thing with teeth on it is the speed transducer. In other words, that drives your speedometer. So regardless of the ring and pinion that you put in here, this always gives you true speed until you make the tires bigger. Uh, of course, one cool thing about our little iDash is you can put a corrected speed uh, on your uh, iDash. Inside here, there's a pinion gear up front, and that pinion gear turns the ring gear, uh, at w which in turn turns, turns the axles and drives the, uh, the tires and puts horsepower to the ground. The horsepower that comes in here is not the horsepower that leaves. There's a frictional and viscous losses going on here. Frictional has to do with rubbing, or, uh, the interaction between uh, the gears, which ho hopefully have some lube film in there, but there's still a fr frictional aspect to this whole system. The viscous, that's the work you're doing to the lube itself. Uh, and you don't want to do a lot of work to the lube itself. That's the whole point here. As you raise the level in here, you tend to carry more over with the ring gear. We've got a little piece of video that should show that. And it drives it out to the front pinion bearing, but also down into the ring and pinion intersection where the two come together. If you raise the level, the running level, you're going to eat more horsepower right here, make higher fluid temperature right here, and get worse fuel economy right here. So it's kind of like this, pinion gear. This guy engages the ring gear, and 
if I get this precisely aligned, I can demo it for you, basically turns the ring gear and drives the wheels. So drive shaft drives the pinion gear, it drives the ring gear, and the lubricant has a level within the housing that lubricates these two at an active dynamic running level that's proper for cooling, life expectancy. This is an American axle, uh, made by American Axle and Machine. These guys know what they're doing. This axle has been used in GM and, and Dodge and Ram since 2001. Ten and a half inch ring gear. Uh, there's a heavy duty one that's 10.8 inches, but basically it's the same setup. So you've got this action going on. There's an awful lot of sliding, rubbing friction being created here between these two surfaces. The idea of the lube is that they never touch each other. There's always a film between them. As the lube temperature goes up, the, the ability of the lubricant to hold these two apart diminishes. So there's a sweet spot in terms of the operating temperature as well. A sweet spot for the lube temperature. We want to test at the same vehicle speed. We want to test at the same power to the rear axle. We want to measure the ambient air temperature. Our first week we kind of felt things out and went through various levels, uh, testing the stock setup. Now we're like three weeks in, so we've got a lot more experience. We have finalized the temp, uh, pardon me, we have finalized the speed at 70 miles an hour. We finalized the horsepower at the surface of the tire uh, or road surface at 250 horsepower. Uh, the engine's turning around 3,000 RPM in this uh, this is a 6.7 uh, dually. Everything has to be equal. Let me preface everything with this. Everything's got to be equal. We wait till the temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit before we start the test. We start every test at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So each test takes us probably about three days with rigging and uh, getting all the sight tubes and everything, everything rigged. We run 70 miles an hour. The air velocity underneath is over 30 miles an hour. Where do we come up with that and how do we produce it? Well, we've got the Banks wind machine that we built some years ago. Uh, and it's got two seven and a half horse three phase motors. So we've got 15 horsepower pushing air at a velocity in, into the nose close to the velocity we're running on the rolls. But drag under the truck, we found running it on the road with our little anemometer measuring the air velocity under the truck, we found that it's about 30, 32 miles an hour under the truck when the fan is engaged at 60 to 70 miles an hour. So we, we wanted to duplicate that, so we kind of built this wind tunnel under the truck uh, to keep, keep all the air we're blowing in the nose under the truck. And we found that our 15 horsepower worth of blower, now it's cooling the truck and it's pushing air under the truck, which we never designed it to do. We had to kick in another couple of horsepower. So we went and bought a couple of carpet dryers or whatever they call them from some guys on the next street over. Now we're at 17 horsepower worth of airflow and we're hitting the numbers. That took a, little, a few days to knock that one down. And oh, by the way, we got to a point with the tires on this dually, uh, once we got all this going, we run the total test about 160 minutes. So that's quite a while. We found the limit of the tire treads. So we started chunking. We're going to take th these tires and true them. They're gonna be basically slicks and we'll be running those as our dyno tires. And the temperatures we're measuring are the temperatures of the lubricant, the temperature of the outside of the cover, the temperature an inch and a half behind the cover, 
This is one of our air mouse sensors that we use to measure ambient air normally in the nose of the truck. But the air mouse measures temperature, pressure, and humidity. So we're getting the temperature uh, behind the axle radiating off the cover to the air. Uh, and we're also measuring the ambient temperature, which usually doesn't change that much during the test, six, seven, eight degrees maybe. We take it until the lubricant's at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we're done. We stop right there. At that point, we maintain the speed, we reduce the power output, and we look at the cooling, the heat rejection, how long does it take for the temperature of the lubricant to fall down and stabilize? We have found on a lot of these, when we get near 300, the gain in temperature is kind of flattening out. We're going to go back and retest the stock cover. We hit 336 the first week, but we were only running 18 miles an hour under the truck uh, airflow. On this particular test, we reached 300 at about 100 minutes into the test, starting at 77. The red trace is the lubricant temperature. The orange trace, or light red trace, is the temperature of the surface of the cover. The orange trace is the temperature of the air an inch and a half behind the cover. And the blue trace is the ambient temperature. So you can see we're running 250 horsepower up to that point. We then drop, oh, the purple trace. That's the rate uh, uh, of change of the temperature of the fluid per minute in degrees Fahrenheit. So that's an interesting thing, and we'll talk more about that in the final part three of this series. Uh, but basically, you can see we drop down to 50 horsepower, and all the temperatures start dropping, and finally normalize at about 160 minutes in. So back to the ring and pinion for a second. As this thing turns, remember I talked about the fluid level. The, there's an intended running fluid level. And then there's an aftermarket running fluid level, and it, every, everybody seems to have a different idea. But I think the intended running fluid level that the manufacturer intended is the correct one. I'm just saying, these guys know more about this than I do. And I'm, I, I think probably more about this than the rest of the aftermarket knows as well. Point being, if you make the level deeper, you submerge, you bury th these gears, you pick up more uh, with the ring gear, you bring more into the rotating pinion gear, and you end up doing more work to the lubricant. And it turns out, if you're not paying attention, you'll inadvertently do more work than this with an aftermarket cover, at least the ones we've got to look at. So let's look at some covers. I think the granddaddy of all this is the Mag High Tech. So this goes back quite a few years. And the first most apparent thing I see on this table is all of these look like that one. They all look like the Mag High Tech. So Let's look at the Meg High Tech. Inside the cover, you, you have a completely different shape going on here. And remember that ring gear is rotating here. With the stock cover, the lubric lubricant has a beautiful path to follow the ring gear. With this cover, the ring gear drives the fluid into this flat surface. Then it has to go up through this notch, but basically hits here and then finally goes over. What you're doing here is you're doing work to the fluid. In other words, you're, you're taking energy from the ring gear that should go out to the tires, and you're using some of it to do this additional work to the fluid. Well, what does that do to the fluid? It raises its temperature. Okay, we got a something that should radiate heat better, but it seems pretty apparent to me that you should design the cover so it doesn't add heat. Uh, so there's Mag High Tech. And 
whether I'm right or not, I don't know yet. I'm just giving opinion. So you go through these, and they look very similar. Some have more ribs, some have less ribs. Uh, some have the ribs uh, running horizontally. Uh, but the insides, you know, I mean, the drain plugs are... Uh, some of them have the bolts top and bottom, some of them don't. Uh, that one has an O-ring, this one doesn't. At the end of the day, uh, having the O-ring is kind of cool. This one not only has the square corners I was kind of complaining about, it's also got this section to minim minimize the use of aluminum, wherein the lube drives in into here, and then it trips itself on this. So, and then you've got a, another cavity to reduce uh, aluminum cost. It also adds drag. And then you bam up here and you've got to make another 90 degree corner with the lubricant. Let me tell you, the lubricant doesn't easily make that 90 degree corner. It's kind of rolling in there. Same here. So, I don't see any improvement in how these have been done since the year one. Now I've got an uh, outlier here, and this is BD. Uh, BD, all of these add fluid capacity. BD has kind of a stock looking top, and then they have this, this reservoir to add fluid capacity, apparently. Uh, this one really adds to the work done to the fluid. Here you're driving the fluid not into a square corner, you're driving it into a cavity. So this fluid is going to get work done to it repeatedly before it finally comes out and joins the par party up here and gets slung out to the nose of the pinion in the differential gear case to lube the front pinion bearing. So this will be interesting. Uh, running these and then running this to see where we're at. What are we using for lubricant? Guys have been asking me online. We're using the Mopar recommended lubricant in the owner's manual. It's the same in this early truck as it is in our new one. Uh, Mopar 75W90 synthetic will we'll be in all the Mopar testing. We're going to go Chevy, and then we'll do Fords as well. But right now, now we're kind of on the Mopar. In reality, we're, we're doing the Chevy test right here because the Chevy uses the same axle. It's got, the axle tubes are slight, uh, slightly different, but it's the same ring and pinion, the same ar architecture, the same bolt pattern on the Chevy. GM has a different fill level than Mopar has, or, or you know, Ram Cummins. We're looking into the pinion angle. That might be part of why they, they may differ, Chevy to, to Dodge and Ram. So this has taken a lot longer than I thought it would take. And it's uh, costing a lot more than I thought it would cost. Uh, but, you know, I still have this curiosity, and so do you at, the, at this point. Uh, we fragged some tires. I'm going to be buying some new tires for this dually. I want to have this all done by the middle of September and put up the results for all of us to see and talk about. So apply a little patience. Uh, this is where we're at. And I'll be back mid-September to give you the final results. Stay tuned. OK, quiet on the set. Hey, we're filming over here. If you like what you've seen and you want some more, subscribe to our channel. If you're looking for bogosity, don't come here. We don't serve bogosity. So I invite you again for more, to learn more. Take a look, subscribe to our channel.